Welcome, Michela, and welcome everybody to the last day of the school. Uh, Michela will be soon joining uh, DeepMind as a research scientist. I'm very happy to, to welcome her uh, DeepMind. Um, previously, she was a postdoctoral post researcher at Facebook AI Research in Mellow Park. And she took a PhD in physics from Yale University. During her graduate studies, she worked on the design, development, and deployment of deep learning algorithm for the Atlas experiment at CERN with a focus on computer vision and generative modeling. Her current research focuses on empirically and theoretically characterizing neural network, sorry, neural network dynamics in the over-parameterized and under-parameterized regimes using pruning as a tool for model compression. So given her experience in physics and in CERN, today she will go into uh, discuss about machine learning for physics. And I'm really, really, really looking forward for this talk. Thank you, Michaela. Well, thank you so much. That was such a kind introduction. Hi, everybody. Uh, I've been chatting <laughs> for a bit on this channel now, but I'm, I'm excited to address everybody in the virtual room. Uh, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here today to talk about um, this fascinating world of machine learning uh, applied to physics. Um, oops. Um, and uh, as, as you just heard, this topic is, is very meaningful to me. So I'm, of course, very biased here because this is exactly the path uh, that I took towards my current role in AI research. But um, today I just hope to be able to either inspire you uh, to take your machine learning skills to a scientific application domain, uh, of which physics, of course, is just one of the many examples. Um, or on the other side, if you are a scientist that is just getting, is just getting started with machine learning, um, I want you to know that if you are interested in pursuing this, there is a path for you from science to pure AI research. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned, I am a physicist by training. I studied physics and astrophysics in undergrad. Uh, and then in my PhD, I wrote a thesis about machine learning uh, solutions for high energy physics. I was affiliated with one of the experiments at CERN. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, and CERN in, in, in Switzerland is, is the home of the Large Hadron Collider, this large machine that collides particles. Uh, and we'll hear a little bit more about it. Um, but why, why am I so passionate about this? I think like to bridge uh, this gap, this uh, culture gap even that exists between AI and physics, we need more people to uh, almost act as liaisons between the two. So I, I've personally been as involved as possible uh, across a variety of different initiatives. There is a machine learning and physical sciences workshop series at NeurIPS that have helped co-organize. Um, I've been co-convener of, of a variety of different tracks uh, for conferences. Uh, in physics, the track would be machine learning and, and data science and so on, summer schools, schools like this one, advocacy in DC. So I think, you know, it, it's a very exciting topic and I hope to be able to uh, impart some of uh, the knowledge, but also the excitement um, about this domain. And so to make sense of today's lecture, um, I first just want to start by asking us, like, why do we do machine learning? You certainly, I expect, learned a lot about this topic over the week. Uh, but why do we study it? Why do we even care about it? Um, and I think on one side, you know, the pursuit of artificial intelligence in its purest form is certainly uh, a totally valid fundamental research question and aspiration. Uh, but many of us would take perhaps a more utilitarian view uh, and, and we would care about machine learning because along the path to solving artificial intelligence, we can also still use it uh, to help us solve everything else. And so ultimately, I think to first order, many of us see uh, machine learning more as a tool uh, to help us answer some of the fundamental questions about uh, humans, human nature, humanity, uh, human interactions, uh, and the world that we live in, um, and as, also to perform uh, some tasks uh, a lot more efficiently. So um, I do imagine that some of you here today would eventually go out and apply uh, machine learning to a variety of different fields. So. Um, what I would like to leave you with is something that uh, you can hopefully use and generalize um, for the application of AI to a variety of different fields, not just physics necessarily. And so, um, of course, I've chosen physics as, as the concrete example here, but I've tried to 
and avoid just uh, you know listing a super domain specific uh, set of, of problems and, and a bibliography of papers uh, from physics. Uh, and instead, I've tried my best to organize this content into uh, into broader themes and ideas and concepts that have emerged and I'm sure will emerge across a variety of different application domains. And so the success stories that we'll talk about today um, are hopefully just here to serve as inspirations for um, how others uh, have thought about tackling certain problems using AI and how they've successfully merged uh, domain knowledge in particular in, in the field of physics here uh, with advanced machine learning methods. Um, and so uh, just to set the stage here a little bit, let me uh, briefly talk about physics in very broad strokes to um, to give you a sense of for, for physics as a field, what's unique about it? What do you need to keep in mind as, as you hear me talk today? Um, and I do believe that many of these points will apply to other domains as well. Um, but, but what's specific about physics is some, some of the questions that it asks. So it's not just what happens in nature, but how and why. What is causing a particular observation that we're making? What's driving this behavior? What's the probability of observing this particular phenomenon? What are uh, the fundamental interactions at play here? Um, and what uh, would different interactions uh, imply in terms of uh, different uh, observables in, in the universe? Uh, would we notice uh, physical phenomena to be particularly different if the laws of physics were different? Um, and so right away, you would notice that physics is not so much interested in uh, numerically approximating data or numerically uh, predicting outcomes, but it's about understanding the underlying laws of nature that cause outcomes uh, that generate the data that we observe. So um, it can be, you know, sometimes useful um, to, as an intermediate step at least, to say, okay, let's formulate your task and, and, and eventually figure out that there are 20 million particles of type X and 30 million of type Y. Um, but the fundamental question that a physicist would always ask is, uh, why are there 20 million particles and not more, not less? Is that the expected number? How have we built that expectation? Where do we build it from? Um, and what would constitute a, a significant deviation from that number? Like how significant would that de deviation be? What's the distribution of outcomes and why does the distribution uh, even look that way? What, what's causing it to look that way? Um, and so my point is that there is a very strong focus in physics on understanding causality on one side, on uncertainty estimation and on statistical analysis, uh, and also on uh, first principles uh, modeling as opposed to simple black box modeling. Um, and those first principles in physics are very strong and very solid. So what we call the standard model of particle physics, it's, it's been described by many as this triumph of the human intellect, uh, because it's generally considered to be one of the most successful and one of the most uh, powerful and comprehensive um, scientific theories out there because it's so accurate and because, it, because of its predictive power. Um, and so, of course, this introduces a little bit of a uh, sociological or political uh, problem, let's say, whenever you try to apply something like AI to a field like physics, because physics has this long and proud history of discovery and of theory refinement. And so, um, you know, like in many other domains as well, I, I think at, at the very first, it wasn't quite so amenable to disruption. Um, and, and so it took years of, of genuine community, community effort and education uh, to, to make sure that uh, machine learning was not perceived as a threat to the status quo. And so in physics, we can't really afford this like move fast and break thing type of philosophy. Of course, we need to move fast, yes, but it's important uh, to, to move carefully, estimate uncertainties, and interpret all the results in a physical way. So out of all that is physics, uh, because of my background and my personal bias today, I'll mostly be pulling in examples from uh, a subfield, which is the one of particle physics. Uh, and so excuse me if I don't uh, necessarily um, do a particularly good job at, at giving you uh, highlights from all of the fields of physics, but um, besides my own personal preference, I, I do objectively think that, that this is a fantastic domain 
uh, for those of you that are looking uh, at working at the intersection of machine learning and science. And, and the reason why that is the case, first of all, is, is that the big picture, I think, is pretty compelling. So the goal of particle physics is to understand the fundamental nature of, of the universe and from the tiniest components of matter uh, to the largest scales and understand the basic interactions among them. And so um, this, you know, has the potential uh, of, of meaning perhaps the discovery of new particles or revolutionizing the way that we that we think about gravity and, and again our universe and quantum field theory. So uh, it, it's very fascinating um, and huge investments have been made worldwide uh, to be able to design, to build and to maintain these generations of particle accelerators and particle detectors. Um, and these have been built to be able to replicate some of the conditions of our early universe just, just minutes after the Big Bang. Um, and so I think applying machine learning and getting any improvement here would be hugely impactful and, and could even result in a Nobel Prize, who knows. Um, so particle physics is great as well because it has a, um, a well-known, long-standing uh, series of unsolved mysteries that we haven't been able to crack just yet. So one of them, just to, just to mention one, would be the nature of dark matter. Um, and so this is a field that can certainly use all the help that it can get. Uh, and I think some of the inefficiencies that we currently see in this field uh, in the way that the data is analyzed uh, and, and processed, I think it could be perfectly tackled by uh, some of the machine learning techniques that we know and love. Um, and high energy physics, uh, I think does belong to the big data world, if you wanna use that word. Um, it, it is almost on par with some of the big tech giants out there in terms of the volumes of data uh, we're able to collect. And it's certainly at the technological forefront compared to other scientific academic domains. The, the web was invited, it was, was invented uh, at CERN. So um, the culture around uh, infrastructure and software engineering uh, is very strong there. Um, but there is always a caveat, um, like any other scientific domain, we should never underestimate uh, its incredible uh, complexity. And so this often makes collaborations between uh, phys uh, physics experts and machine learning experts somewhat difficult in the sense that, that we don't necessarily speak the same language, we don't necessarily share the same tools, uh, we might not even share an appreciation or an understanding of all of the caveats and all the nuances of both the problem statement and the suggested solution. So, um, you know, it's really hard to distill uh, physics problems, like true physics problems down to, uh, you know, simple tasks that you can just upload on Kaggle uh, and, and that the machine learning community can just use as benchmarks. So the challenges in, in making this work are, are real. Um, and so how does machine learning empower physics at a place like the Large Hadron Collider? Uh, and we know that machine learning has been uh, proven to be very, very powerful tool in the arsenal of any um, physical scientist over the past decade or so. And, and we know that in many sub-disciplines of physics has given us uh, renewed hope and optimism for the future to be able to tackle some of the um, some of the obstacles, like statistical and computational, I would say, uh, that sooner or later we were doomed to face uh, in, in fields like the sciences. And so um, folks that have been able to bridge these two domains are, are currently, I would say, quite sought after. Uh, and so it's also like a very promising field uh, career-wise. Okay, so in practice. Um, our ultimate goal in uh, particle physics is to take the detector readout and figure out what caused it, what caused these electrical signals that we see. Was it a Higgs boson passing through? Was it dark matter? Um, and in practice, what we're uh, doing is to try to learn some fa function, uh, mapping a set of electrical signals from the detectors all the way to particle identification. But this is obviously like some non-trivial function and it cannot you know, be simply uh, done in one pass. And so I think the power of applying deep learning here uh, resides in being able to tackle this problem by breaking it down um, into a series of nested mappings, which is what uh, deep learning is, is strong uh, at. And so deep nets give us this uh, flexibility to, to get to reconstruct this final complicated function by sort of taking baby steps and sequentially learning uh, more and more abstract features of the data. 
So the data. <laughs> so one thing that I think uh, is very important in every single application domain is to understand uh, how peculiar the data is there. Um, and this is actually going to get us very quickly into our very first theme and that I hope can uh, be generalizable across a variety of different domains and a variety of different adjacent fields. Um, and that is that uh, the data is unique. The data in physics is very complex, very high dimensional as you see here. So this is a uh, schematic representation of course of what happens after a collision. So a collision happens at the center of the image and then lots of outgoing secondary particles are coming out uh, because of decays and various interactions. Um, so, so the data is, as I said before, perfectly suited for machine learning. And why? Um, because it's less, you know, perfectly suited for, for humans in a way. We as humans like to digest, um, you know, lower dimensional interpretable spaces. That's how we reason. Um, and that's the story been done. So the data has been reduced through a series of engineering steps. Um, uh, in which we progressively would reduce the dimensionality of the data uh, into something that we'd be able to digest. But of course, at each step of data reduction, uh, there is a certain degree of information loss that can perhaps be avoided. And with machine learning, in fact, what, uh, what we've been able to do is to use um, higher and higher dimensional information, going, getting closer to the raw uh, detector readouts um, and, and getting to this higher dimensional representation. And so this information summarization uh, makes sense, of course, if the ultimate analyzer is a human analyzer that has to go through the data and pick out the signal uh, because we cannot just look at raw patterns in the data and, and find them with our naked eye. That's not how it happens. But machines are actually excellent at uh, finding patterns in raw data. And so we should let them act in the environment that they're most suited for. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so unlike other fields uh, in the sciences, uh, actually physics is blessed with typically having enormous quantities of available data, uh, either through the experimental data itself or through some very accurate scientific simulation. We'll talk about that. Um, but also in physics, um, certainly more so than uh, in the natural um, you know, uh, data or societal data that AI is usually applied to in, in the AI literature, the data here in physics is very, very highly structured. Um, because there is some sort of a logic behind physics, there are rigid models and laws that describe the behavior uh, of physical objects. And these don't change over time, they don't change over space because they're universal laws. Um, and so this brings us to sort of a common debate uh, in physics, which, which asks uh, whether we should let an AI system learn centuries of physics knowledge in a fully automated, uh, fully data-driven, end-to-end way, or whether we should use our knowledge of these physics laws and these symmetries and the rigid structure uh, of nature that we know of uh, to somehow guide the model towards uh, a more promising uh, solution subspace. Um, and so I don't necessarily want to give you my answer or the answer to, to this question in this debate, but I want to leave you with some food for thoughts to, uh, for you to consider. Um, and, and I will tell you some arguments on both sides. So on one side, people would argue that you know, with enough data, uh, which we have, uh, the system should easily eventually pick up on these constraints and these regular patterns by itself, uh, especially if we, what we're interested in is, uh, is building a true artificial intelligence. So, you know, if we do like three quarters of the job for it ourselves, then, uh, you know, are we really taking advantage of the of the power of AI? Are we really pushing the boundaries of artificial intelligence? And are we learning anything about how an artificially intelligent system would tackle these problems. What are they? What are they looking at? Um, and on the other side, people would would say, however, that you know th these are all very interesting questions about uh, artificial intelligence. But we're you know they are not necessarily artificial intelligence researchers. They are uh, physics scholars, and their task is to solve a physics task, not to solve intelligence. So why should I not try to encode my very strong uh, prior knowledge into the model? Uh, through some sort of inductive bias to make sure that the model uh, cannot not respect uh, some of the laws of physics that we know and love. And so, you know, I'm sure this discussion is taking place across a variety of different applications of AI uh, across different domains. And for example, in, in uh, medicine, um, in, in medical sciences, like there is a constant back and forth between, you know, learning symmetries from scratch versus 
uh, aiding the model uh, with, uh, you know, invariance aware, or, or once again, physics aware, biology aware uh, models and layers that have been purpose built for that. Um, and so I want to point out, for example, there's some great work out of uh, folks at Amsterdam, like Max Welling, Taka Cohen, uh, and their collaborators, like bridging uh, the fields uh, of physics and AI. So bringing physics notions of equivariance and symmetry, for example, in the way that they design uh, neural networks. Okay, so a uh, one very crucial point and lesson uh, that I learned about data, and so we're still talking about data, uh, from my experience in machine learning for physics is that the data representation that you pick to represent your data will almost certainly dictate uh, the type of machine learning model that you will end up using. Uh, and so this is a particle collision. Um, uh, and so what we've registered here isn't a bunch of one dimensional features that you put in a table of engineered features. The, the, those are the ones that are built by scientists, but what we really get out of the detector is much more information, which looks exactly like what you're seeing here. Uh, this is a real proton-proton collision, by the way, that was registered by the ATLAS detector at CERN. So we have uh, two protons that collide at the center uh, and it create the splash of outgoing particles that are uh, detected by the ATLAS detector. And so you can clearly see by eye that there are these two areas with lots of activity, um, lots of uh, particle trajectories, like these like spaghetti-like uh, bunches, and they are associated with a lot of energy depositions uh, throughout what we call the calorimeter detector. Uh, and so we circle those areas uh, with these cones, and so these cones will be called jets. So I'll be talking about jets quite a bit. Jets are just these clusters of energy, basically. And so how you represent those really matters. So if you store your particle collision data as pictures, you will naturally tend to want to borrow ideas from the fields of computer vision and use models from computer vision and, and AI in that subfield. Uh, if instead you store your data as sequences of particle positions over time, uh, then with sequence data, you would most naturally use stuff like recurrent neural networks type of models. So you would borrow from uh, natural language processing uh, literature, for example. Um, and these are exactly actually the first two uh, formats that people adopted, of course, after uh, the tabular data format of, of uh, human engineered features that we talked about. Uh, and so as a consequence of that, you'll find uh, a lot of early papers in machine learning for physics using, you know, VGG uh, like uh, type of architectures for computer vision on one side, and then LSTMs and GRUs on the other side for sequence data. Uh, and computer vision by, by now is literally everywhere in physics. So jet classification uh, that had historically been done with, with a very high degree of success, of course, uh, using these um, handfuls of uh, uh, carefully crafted variables that were designed by, by our amazing theorists. Uh, well, over the past five years or so, we've seen hundreds of papers in the uh, machine learning for physics literature that have moved towards computer vision methods that don't rely on almost any knowledge of theoretical jet physics, yet have been able to outperform uh, some of the traditional methods consistently. Uh, and I think the advantages of using ConvNets, for example, on image data uh, uh, at the LHC and beyond are, are really, um, there are many of such, such advantages. So first of all, um, they uh, allows us. They allow us. They allow us, as I said, to uh, move closer to the raw detector readouts. So avoiding all those many steps of lossy compression. So reducing our inductive bias somehow. Um, and it's really allowed us to stand on the shoulders of giants. I like to say because it's it's been allowing us to take advantage of every single improvement that comes out of the machine learning computer vision. Uh, research and just take those ideas, borrow them, and, and show improvements uh, in physics. And finally, uh, I think there is another interesting standpoint um, that is the practical standpoint of, of giving us a representation of uh, fixed dimensionality. So the dimensions of the image are fixed and they do not increase as more particles uh, are present in an event. Um, and then actually what you see here that is really, really important for physicists is the idea of interpretability. So it's the possibility of really truly inspecting the inner workings of our network and looking at correlations between, for example, the output of the network and some known physics that, that we've come to know over the 
centuries of physics that we've done. So in this example, for, um, for example, that you see here, there are some areas of the image that are marked in blue that are um, more uh, highly activating for a certain class of jets and then the red ones for another class of jets. And, and these actually match uh, our physics knowledge of the topology of these two different kinds of events. Um, and there are many examples of uh, even semantic segmentation uh, applications, clustering, uh, and a lot more that you can uh, look up if you're interested. Uh, and so the alternative inside that I mentioned earlier is to take these blue trajectories that form what we call the jet uh, and put them into a sequence. So just kind of like a sequence of words uh, in a sentence. Uh, and again, that obviously allowed us to use some NLP inspired techniques. Uh, at the time, of course, it was primarily recurrent neural networks um, to, to really dramatically improve uh, particle recognition performance on the LHC. Um, but still talking about data formats, we, we've just talked about a couple of them. Uh, I think more recently, physicists have really realized that perhaps the most suitable data representation of all is actually a graph where each node is could be a hit. So a signature of that a particle leaves in a specific point of the detector, so some electronic readout, uh, and the edges could be connections between these hits. So, so uh, you know, certainly in a connecting the dot uh, along a trajectory of a particle. Um, and so these days, I think like the most uh, popular papers that you'll read in machine learning for physics literature um, are focused on the use of graph neural network uh, to be able to suit this particular uh, type of data representation, which in many ways is the closest thing that you can get to the true detectors electronics without any uh, lossy data pre-processing at all, even you know, to try to turn it into image format. Um, and so what is the takeaway of this entire discussion? Um, the, the question that you should always be asking yourself and keeping in mind when working in an application domain is, what is the most natural and most convenient data format for me? And how does that affect uh, even the type of machine learning that I could ever imagine doing on this data uh, for a particular task? Okay, so regardless of how you end up representing your uh, data feature matrix X, which is what we talked about so far, uh, the question that becomes, okay, well, what about why? What about the labels? How do we get the labels? Where do we get them from? And unfortunately, if we feel like particle physics, the data uh, comes out of the detector completely unlabeled and unlabelable, meaning that uh, you know it's so dense and it's so complex and so high dimensional that uh, it's literally impossible to just comb through it and pick out all the particles by eye and assign a true uh, label to them. Like you, you, you know, you can hire mechanical turkers, not even if they all had you know uh, Nobel prizes in physics. It's literally impossible for the most part. Um, and so uh, how can we ever do any machine learning at all without labels? Uh, so there are different solutions. Uh, solution number one, which we'll discuss more in depth later, is to go through simulation. So develop um, analysis and classifiers based on simulated data. Uh, so simulate, simulate the type of collisions that you would normally get out of the Large Hadron Collider with very accurate scientific simulation. Um, and so because we write and we design that ourselves and we drive it ourselves, we know what happens in the simulation and we get the labels out uh, for free. Uh, but other solutions that I just want to briefly mention has been, um, have included, you know, the use of unsupervised, weakly supervised, self-supervised uh, machine learning te techniques to be able to build strong representation with or without labels, or maybe exploit some partial information that we have. Uh, so maybe we know the fraction of the data that belong in each, belongs to each class. Uh, or we have some sort of noisy uh, labels of the data. So we wouldn't necessarily have to rely exclusively uh, on simulation. And I left you some pointers here. Um, but okay, but I said that we do have quite a lot of labeled data. And so where does this come from? It comes from simulation, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, how is the simulation obtained? Can we trust it? And then, you know, if you're a good machine learning practitioner, you should always ask, does it scale? Um, and, and if you have worked in any scientific domain, and here I would include also, you know, the automotive industry, aerodynamics, aerospace, and so on, you know that uh, many of these fields rely on very precise simulation of very complex physical processes, uh, you know, from the design or the reliability stress testing uh, of new parts or vehicles um, or, or for the inference of parameters uh, or the inference of, of behavior under different uh, stimulated conditions or, uh, you know, just to solve these complex systems of equations that govern the evolution of the system. Uh, and simulation is traditionally performed with very complex uh, very highly specialized computer solvers, 
um, that almost always rely traditionally on high performance computing, uh, on uh, highly optimized code um, to, to get to the expected results that you'd want to get. Um, and so the family uh, of, uh, of programs here of routines oftentimes includes everything from, um, you know, for, from, for different levels of approximation to the problem. So from, uh, you know, the perfect, uh, uh, in the most um, precise level of, uh, of simulation that really perfectly um, solves all of the underlying equations and, and, and gives you the, the best uh, precision uh, for the underlying process that you're interested in, all the way to very coarse approximations, so, you know, maybe first order behavior only. Um, and so there tends to be always this trade off between um, simulation accuracy on one side, uh, in the sense of like the level of detail that the description uh, will give you, and the computational cost. So you have to balance the two. Um, and in certain domains, including particle physics, this cost uh, over the years has become prohibitive. So the cost of producing uh, the amounts of simulated data that is necessary uh, for the uh, at the precision, especially uh, that is required by some of the precision measurements that are uh, being done by some analyses, um, and even using you know very large you know top computational resources uh, pulled together through what we call the worldwide LHC computing grid uh, that is this, you know multi-tier distributed computing network that physicists have access to. Uh, even that uh, would fall short to some of the needs of uh, the next, not the current generation. Uh, of physics analysis and, and experiments. So um, that is where some of us, I would say, uh, including, you know, at Yale, Berkeley, Stanford, and so on, uh, that's where we identified an opportunity for machine learning. Uh, and so this was back in 2014, 2015, when we started this line of work looking at uh, what was well known to be um, one of the most computationally intensive bottlenecks of the entire simulation pipeline of an experiment like Atlas at CERN. Um, and uh, and the, this particular bottleneck specifically was the simulation uh, of how the remnants of a particle collision would move outwards uh, through the detector layers, specifically through what we call the calorimeter uh, and interact with it. Uh, and back then, we were inspired by the, the newfound excitement at the time around deep generative modeling, uh, specifically around uh, generative adversarial networks, but also variational autoencoders and so, and so on, uh, and how you know, they seem to be just great uh, at encoding data distributions. And in our case, we wanted to see if they were also great at encoding the data distribution that is produced by those traditional simulators um, and therefore um, serve us as, as a tool to replace portions of that very compute intensive scientific simulation pipeline that I just described uh, using a much more efficient AI powered uh, type of method. Um, and so, uh, once again, talking about data, though, uh, the problem is that a lot of the, those off-the-shelf uh, generative adversarial network models that you'd find maybe pre-trained in some repository, that they just wouldn't cut it for the type of data that we were talking about. So what is the data here? So the data is the passing through the volumes of the detectors through the different layers of a high energy particle. In this case, it would be a positron, for example, or an electron. Um, and we have this multi-layer detector volume with different geometry and resolution, uh, different segmentation into voxels of different size. So it, it's a 3D uh, type of representation. It's a very complex one. Um, it has a sparsity constraints. So this uh, generative adversarial network model uh, would have to be able to, to handle a very high dynamic range of pixel values. Uh, so model over uh, six mag orders of magnitude and intensity of the pix pixels while retaining the correct sparsity, as I mentioned, because uh, the locality of fe features here is, is really semantically important. Like we're simulating physics. And if we make any mistake here, you know, it would give us totally unphysical and therefore totally uh, useless simulation. And again, it's a 3D uh, type of problems and it has to be uh, conditioned on some physical properties of the incoming particles, such as the, you know, the position, uh, the angle, the energy, and so on. And so the main takeaway is that uh, this model ultimately, without going into any necessarily uh, any uh, details of the architecture, but I'm happy to comment on them offline if you're interested in that. But the takeaway here is that this model was able uh, to learn and reproduce uh, physical data distributions with very high levels of agreement. 
because of some of the um, of the modifications that we made to the architecture to be able to suit that data format. So the data format should always uh, be in the back of your mind and drive every decision that you make in an application domain. Uh, and so qualitatively here on the right, what you're seeing at the very top is uh, um, the average image uh, for a positron going through the three different uh, detector layers that we have in this problem. And at the bottom, you see the equivalent uh, result from our uh, GAN model. Um, but besides the qualitative uh, evaluation that you saw on the right here, the real deal is what you see on the left, if you're ever interested in reading the details. But the takeaway is we get significant speed ups in simulation time over 100,000 times faster potentially than some of the traditional simulators with, as you can see uh, on the right, is that like some good levels of agreement. Uh, and another example of work in this direction outside of particle physics that, that I wanted to mention is what's come to be known as the COSMOGAN. Uh, so it is not just particle physics, but physics in general that has been um, uh, improving as a whole uh, with machine learning. So uh, in this case, the challenge was, um, uh, you know, starting from uh, a at least partially semantically meaningful latent space that encodes the different parameters of, of the universe that we want to generate, um, the authors had to produce this very uh, highly detailed results of the time evolved configuration of the universe with all the structured uh, lumps of, of matter and, and the vacuum elsewhere um, and have a generative adversarial network be able to uh, quickly execute the simulation um, because they would want to um, quickly get a sense for um, what different universes would look like uh, as a result of changes in the initial parameters of, of the cosmological model that they were simulating. So this is another great um, application. And so from, from particle physics to cosmology and, and across a variety of different domains as well, uh, I would say that for the past five years or so, we've, we've really seen uh, a move towards this type of fast simulation uh, powered by deep generative modeling uh, to try to emulate the output distribution uh, uh, that would normally be produced by a traditional scientific simulator based on HPC. Um, and so we've seen a proliferation of this type of model to, to, to get this uh, fast and cheap and, and still reliable uh, simulation, maybe not to necessarily replace uh, traditional simulators altogether, but to at least augment it, uh, um, for, for all of the downstream tasks. Um, and the reason why I'm really stressing this, uh, this uh, application domain uh, is, is that there is a breadth of other um, subfields of, of the sciences of physics, uh, but, but beyond that as well, that have the same issue. They, and they, they make use of the same uh, compute intensive simulation packages uh, that we use in physics. And, uh, and I certainly foresee that this would be a very impactful um, uh, set of problems to tackle across a variety of different fields. So there is no shortage of fields if, if you want to uh, make progress in this direction towards scientific simulation from neuroscience, medical imaging, uh, nuclear physics, you know, at reactors, chip design and semiconductors, uh, space missions at NASA and ASA, they have to simulate, uh, you know, interactions maybe of, of cosmic rays with their uh, machinery. And this is just to name a few. So they all rely on very uh, detailed simulation. And I think it'd be interesting uh, to pursue projects of this kind across um, a variety of fields like these. And so the question becomes, is there a path then towards uh, what would be physically sound and efficient and fast uh, AI? So to really uh, get the most out of uh, some of the computational speed ups that we just discussed, the AI affords us um, both at the generative uh, modeling uh, level, but also probably more often also on the uh, discriminative side as well. I think uh, physicists have uh, now been looking at methods to uh, deploy these deep neural networks that they've designed uh, on FPGAs or custom ASICs or coprocessors in general uh, to try to reduce the latency at inference time um, to a minimum to to be able to to have you know this harbor based real time almost decision making uh, that would happen perhaps at experiment sites um, and so um, at particle accelerators like the ones that we uh, that we have like the LHC for example we have 
billions of particle collisions that are happening uh, every second. And we need to very quickly skim through them, quickly analyze them, filter them into you know, high level categories of interesting and non-interesting. And the point is that the non-interesting ones just get discarded permanently and, and thrown away most of the time. So it's important to, to make this decision and to make it happen fast. Like, microseconds type of fast and in this you know microseconds for the entire maybe like uh elt uh, pipeline and so um to that end there have been mostly two directions i think that, that i would identify as important so on uh on one side you know fpga programming making that a lot uh easier and more accessible to both machine learning practitioners and physicists alike uh so maybe moving towards um more straightforward uh transpilers for our machine learning models uh, and then on the other hand something that i've been interesting in interested in also on the pure machine learning side of things which is uh, model compression so to be able to uh, even fit those big models onto these devices. And this includes uh, techniques like pruning, like model distillation, quantization, factorization, and, and a lot more. Okay, so we have all of the stringent um, deployment concerns that I think in many ways make applying machine learning to a field like particle physics a lot more uh, similar to research engineering uh, than pure AI research. And I think uh, ultimately, in an application domain, just like um, the same way you would find this in uh, in a product team in industry, uh, you need to carefully balance a lot of many competing objectives, and and accuracy and performance uh, are just one of them. Um, and so many times, you you don't necessarily have the luxury, for example, to ship enormous state of the art models with billions of parameters that can't even fit on a single GPU and maybe occupy gigabytes in space and you can't store them, you can't download them. Like where would the waste be stored? That's something important to, to consider. What's the lifetime of the model? Like how often would I need to retrain it? How often can I afford to retrain it? Um, and what's my retraining strategy here? Like, do I freeze some of the layers and only retrain a few of them? Um, how is the model even version controlled? And, uh, you know, wh what's our serving strategy? How do you avoid downtime? Because, you know, downtime in a place like the LHC, given uh, the cost of, of building and operating it, uh, could be very expensive. Um, and um, yeah, other concerns would be, you know, wh what's the data provenance? Uh, is it, is it uh, properly cataloged? Um, what if there are uh, changes in the data format as we discussed uh, or shifts in the data distribution? And this is once again, very similar to the concern that some of the big tech companies have in trying to capture uh, the newest and latest trends in uh, their users, users behavior uh, and being able to predict that and adjust to that. Um, but also, again, as we, as we mentioned, what's the maximum latency that I can afford? Um, what are some of the pathological edge cases? And, and am, I, um, am I robust to those? Uh, who's on call this week? <laughs> you know, like who will take care uh, of the operations of, uh, of a place like CERN? And so this entire, um, uh, yeah, all of these constraints, I think, like make uh, working a certain very similar to, to working at a large tech company and an engineering team. Uh, and so I think it's a wonderful path uh, for, for people that have uh, a machine learning uh, industry aspirations. Um, and so I know I don't have too much time uh, remaining necessarily to, to try to maybe leave some, some room for questions. Uh, and I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, just a laundry list uh, of ideas here, but uh, I want to just uh, flash out a few topics uh, and leave you with some pointers in case you uh, you want to go check some things out on your own uh, if you're interested in going deeper uh, deeper in some of these um, these topics. And so, um, some of the trends that I think have really dominated the physics landscape uh, at this intersection with AI. Uh, as of recent, especially. Um, I, I've listed a few of them here, but a few that I want to point out that come to mind would be, of course, anomaly detection, uh, very well underway at this point, uh, but also uh, developing notions of fairness. And what does that mean? So, uh, you know, in the same way uh, for, I don't know, a loan assignment model, for example, uh, you know, you'd want that to be um, fair across demographics and across subgroups that have been uh, defined along certain predefined attributes uh, in very similar ways in physics we would want to we would want our machine learning models to be 
fair uh, to particles of all energies and all momenta. And we would like uh, for our models to not pick up on some, uh, you know, non-causal uh, spurious correlation between um, some uh, sensitive attributes of the particle and whatever it is that we're trying to predict uh, about it. Um, other things that come to mind and may or may not be on this list are probabilistic uh, programming or Bayesian deep learning also for uh, the very important problem of uncertainty estimation uh, in the model decision so that it can be combined uh, in a statistically sound uh, way with the statistical and systematic uncertainties that you would get out of, a, of an experiment in the sciences. Um, what else? Like reinforcement learning maybe for, for accelerator physics. Uh, for, so maybe for the realignment or, um, or the parameter um, estimation for various bits of, of the machine. Um, even like work of in, at the intersection of physics and robotics. So, so tactile uh, sensors to, to try to predict uh, the forces and the torques and, and the dynamics of objects and the interaction of a robotic arm with it. So I think there's just so many interesting topics that are worth exploring. Uh, and so where can you find out more? I want to leave you with some additional resources that I would recommend. Um, for example, there is a physics uh, meets machine learning seminar in the bottom right corner that I uh, left you the link for. We're uh, live on, on Zoom and uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, so definitely check it out. Um, uh, certainly check out the presentations and the papers that were uh, presented at the machine learning and the physical sciences workshop in Europe this year and in the previous years. Uh, there the LHC Olympics so with some very interesting challenges and benchmarks. Uh, if you want something more Kaggle style, maybe, uh, and then some uh, very famous and very well established um, uh, references in the literature that I listed here. And so in summary, what can we say? So applying uh, AI to science is, uh, it comes with a lot of constraints and caveats that I think cannot be ignored. And this is true for physics, but for a lot of other uh, application domains as well. Uh, and so we need to be a little bit cautious and remember uh, the deep learning is not a silver bullet. Um, we certainly care about performance, yes, but, but ultimately machine learning cannot be a replacement for thinking and for domain knowledge. And domain knowledge can actually be super useful uh, in informing how to best tackle the problem. Um, and so uh, the way that I see uh, physics interact with deep learning is, is usually through the simple cycle. So we as physicists uh, ask physics questions that we oftentimes uh, cannot uh, just answer ourselves. So we ask for help uh, to, we ask machine learning for help and machine learning being, you know, it's a full fledged uh, fields with all the uh, ramifications that have attached a variety of different applications domains it comes with very efficient solutions. And these solutions have been designed and tested specifically uh, for a variety of different types of data formats from raw data to text to images. Uh, and we as physicists get to take a look uh, at those problems and those solutions that machine learning people have come up with in the literature. Um, and then we would draw analogies to our problems and borrow some of these solutions to help us answer our physics questions. And so to conclude, there is this uh, quote that I always like to bring up uh, from, from Tim Alpenzeller, uh, and this came from a science magazine article called The AI Revolution in, the Sci in Science. Uh, and the quote says that AI promises to supercharge the process of discovery in the sciences. Uh, and I think examples of success stories as we've seen are already everywhere, not just in physics, but also if you think about climate science, medicine, biology, astronomy, uh, geophysics, and so on. So uh, moving forward, I want to leave you with some optimistic point of view. I think the possibilities are really endless. So I really encourage you to uh, keep track of what's going on in the machine learning applied to physics. And if you get a chance to contribute to uh, scientific application domains. Uh, so that's it. Thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I think uh, please go ahead.